Hello and greetings, Rosie Finchers. My name is Janice Gardner. I'm an ecologist and the interim executive director here at Sageland Collaborative. I'm coming to you from Salt Lake City, Utah, which is the ancestral homeland of the Eastern Shoshone, Ute and Goshu tribes, and also home of the Great Salt Lake, a wetland of hemispheric importance. And I'm so happy to have you all here. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This event is being recorded and you all have the opportunity to show your wonderful human faces on your screen, but please stay muted so there aren't any sound distractions. And um, of course, we expect you all to respect each other during this event. We will um, introduce our Rosie Finch experts that are joining us tonight. We'll premiere the nine minute long Rosie Finch video, and I'll do a short presentation about some of the things we've learned throughout the Feeder Count project. And then we'll hold a little time to do some Q&A with our panel of experts. And we'll be accepting questions from you all through the chat feature on Zoom. So that's the best way to communicate with us. And we'll get through as many questions as we can. So with that, I'd love to, um, like I said, my name is Janice. And one of the things that I love about working with Rosie Finches is I've came to know them um, skiing up at Alta and that's a, a place that's very near and dear to my heart. So Rosie Finchers are kind of symbolic of many good times on the hills. And I'm pleased to introduce Cooper Farr, who is the Director of Conservation at the Tracy Aviary. Cooper, if you wanna unmute for a minute and wave and say a little hello to everyone. Yeah. Hello everyone. Yeah, I'm Cooper uh, with Tracy Aviary. Um, yeah, longtime lover of Rosie Finches. I, I just find them to be such, you know, interesting, cool, like hardy, tough little birds that are up in these really rugged places. And it's, um, yeah, it's always magical when I get to see them. So yeah, that's me. Thanks, Cooper. Next, we have Brian Maxfeld, who is a wildlife biologist with the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. And he's based out of the Northeastern region of Utah. Brian, you wanna say hello? Hello. Yep. This is Brian Maxfield. A um, little bit. Uh, I really like rosy finches because of where they live. Um, uh, that's probably my favorite habitat type to be in up in that high, high Arctic or Alpine tundra and um, just enjoy being up there with those birds and all the other wildlife that's up there. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for all that you do. And then Tempe Regan, who is also a wildlife biologist with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. And she has been doing intensive rosy finch research for several years now. So Tempe, would you love to, we'd love for you to say hello. Hi, my name is Tempe Regan. Like Janice said, I'm a non-game biologist with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. And I've been lucky enough to spend the last five summers in pursuit of the black rosy finch on their breeding grounds. And my favorite thing about them is how much I've learned about them, but also how much I've learned about myself and the places that they've taken me and the places I've gotten to see because I'm looking for them. And they've really just made me an alpine expert because they're the reason I've been up there. So I, I'm grateful to them. Oh, love that. <laughs> okay. So with that, um, let's premiere our video. So everyone just say a little prayer for us. We're going to transition over to the video and hope everything works. Okay. So Sarah, um, I will let you share the screen. And again, make sure everyone has the, their mute on with no dis noise distractions, please. And here we go. Just going to be real quick about this. Here's another one in case you need to slip that hand into your other pocket. Okay. Remember, I almost got frostbit this morning. My name is Chris Purdy, and the, one of the reasons that I love birding is because my mother was a birder, and she saw her first bird land in the driveway when she was pregnant with me and she <laughs> influenced me and my brothers and sisters to become bird watchers. Years ago, I saw my first rosy finches in the town of Alta. 
But I did not want to be running down to Alta every time that I wanted to see rosy finches in the winter. So Powder Ridge Village Condominiums was willing to host a bird feeder. So I put the bird feeder up in 2009 and we started attracting rosy finches here right away. And after a while, this became one of the most reliable sites in Utah to attract rosy finches. Rosy finches are some of the least studied species in North America because they live in such rugged climates, but at least in the winter they're attracted to bird feeders. And that allows us to be able to capture, to band them, and start gaining data about this species that we did not know in the past. Like, I actually feel like there's an icicle on my eyelash. <laughs> so today we are at Powder Mountain in northern Utah, and we are with the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, and we are bird banding. And what that means is we're safely capturing birds, and we're putting little bracelets on them with unique IDs, and that allows us to track their survival and health in the long term. So rosy finches are finches, so they're a medium-sized bird. And up close, what makes them really unique is that they have this beautiful pink on their feathers. And there's really few birds here in North America that have that beautiful pink. It's a good day. I'm good. Thank you. Any more bags or anything? Nope. Okay, I got a big old glob of them. Rosy finches inside. So these rosy finches, there are yeah. three gray crown rosy finches and one black rosy finch. And now they're sort of in the queue so that they can get measured and weighed and recorded on this laptop. They each get their unique band. Um, that's part of a federal bird banding program. And then they get released. Let's say one, four, five, nine, five. It's 27.9. This one I'm going to call an after second year. After second. So no molt limit is present on that, meaning that all the feathers are molted at the same time. Yeah, so they'll store the fat up underneath their throat and then kind of in their collarbone, wishbone area. So in order to get a look at it. You blow on it, it's kind of a third hand to get those feathers out of the way. Yeah. It's pretty How does that feel? Awesome. <laughs> Today was an exciting banding day because we banded our highest total ever rosy finches. We banded 58 gray crowned rosy finches. We banded one black rosy finch. We recaptured a total of 10 rosy finches of both species that we have previously banded. And we also banded a handful of mountain chickadees. So it was a very active and busy day throughout our entire banding period. One of the things that is so important and I'm so appreciative on this project is how the biologists are really coming together to understand these birds during the full year, so their full annual life cycle. I mean, what I love about rosy finches as a biologist and just a lover of birds is that these species really connect me with the mountains, so it's like the shared love of place. So we just did our last survey point and we are in the Sawtooth Mountains at this beautiful alpine lake 
and we were lucky enough to see a black rosy finch. I remember my first alpine survey. We were like at point four or five of the survey, kind of running out of space and thinking like, oh, oh well, you know. And then all of a sudden we, I was just, I just heard a, a bird and I was like, I have never heard that bird in my life, except on Xenocanto, that's a black rosy finch. And I just, I'll never forget that first black rosy finch that I saw. They're just this crazy bird that is inhabiting this very rugged environment. And every survey we get a finch on, it's always so exciting. Black rosy finches are one of those species. Um, we, we don't know a ton about them. However, we've learned a lot more in the past few years. And because of the threats of climate change on the alpine habitat, we think that they could be in trouble. The alpine has changed in the last 50 to 70 years, and so has the climate. And so if we don't get up here now and see what's going on with these birds, we might miss what's affecting them with the changing climate. This morning we're doing a traverse across the talus, across this whole basin, and every 250 meters we place a point and we sit there and do a 15 minute point count. And during that point count we're targeting black rosy finches, American pika, mountain goats, bighorn sheep, and hoary marmots. So it's really important to be collecting this baseline data on these species of greatest conservation need so that we can either find out ways to conserve them and then delist them from our state list or find out what their status is and maybe what we need to do to conserve them better. So by coupling the work of researchers like Tempe here up in Idaho um, our other colleagues across the Intermountain West were able to piece together the full story, the full year-round life cycle story for rosy finches so that we can then protect, manage, conserve them. My hope for rosy finches and the outcomes of this project is that we can find ways that these birds can persist into the future despite some of the tricky challenges that climate change um, uh, present. Exciting. You ready? Yeah. Hey, buddy. And why do you love this work? Like, what oh. is exciting about it to you? Because I'm a biologist wannabe? No, I'm kidding. You can edit that piece out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It was a little choppy on my end, but it worked all right. So um, thanks for everyone's prayers for technology. Um, and I would love to do, if you'd all love to go off mute, if you dare to do that, and just a big round of applause to Sarah Woodbury, who is our communications director, who is the director, videographer, and just talented artist that put that video together. So thank you, Sarah. Woo! Well applause done. for biologists and volunteers. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. All right, let's talk a little bit about the work that you've all done. So over the past three years, you all have contributed 1,912 feeder counts. That's over 5,000 black rosy finches, over 30,000 gray crown rosy finches, and over 10,000 brown capped rosy finches that you've all counted. And that actually equates to 
Uh, 637 hours of watching birds or 26 days. Um, we had almost 300 of you all participate on this project and that covers 10 states. And you've all basically, you've put rosy finches on the map quite literally. Many of these locations where you've documented rosy finches um, were not accounted for otherwise. So that's a pretty big deal. And like we said in the video, we've off like, Biologists and conservationists have often been focused on where birds are during the breeding season, but birds most spend their they spend most of their time on their non-breeding grounds. Um, so it's really important to understand the year-round life histories of these birds, which you've all helped to do. And I'm happy to report that this uh, data is shared with our state partners and it's already being incorporated into natural history uh, databases. And those get incorporated into uh, individual state wildlife action plans, which are basically the roadmaps for how to protect wildlife like rosy finches. So our major objective with the feeder count portion of this overall research program is um, to help uh, understand stand some things like, are rosy finches migrating near or far? Um, who needs to work together? So for example, the birds here in Utah, are our black rosy finches resident birds? Are they breeding in Utah and wintering here? Or are Utah's birds spending their summers breeding in Idaho and Wyoming? And this matters because we need to make sure that people like Brian and Tempe are sharing information and the conservation actions are helping the entire populations of um, rosy finches. You know, and one of the things that is left unanswered is really what makes a bird feeder attractive to a rosy finch. Many of you that participated live in places um, where there hadn't been rosy finches in the past, or maybe you set up a bird feeder in hopes that you would attract a rosy finch. And unfortunately that we learned that if you build it, they may not come. Um, so we appreciate um, you all for giving it a go in some new locales. Um, that's a part of the data that we haven't yet dug into, and we're eager to see if we can find any trends about what makes these feeders attractive to our rosy finches. So another key aspect of this is, if you recall, we're always asking you to look out for those color banded rosy finches. Um, if people out there in the landscape can spot some of our banded birds away from where they are tagged, we can really start to piece together the story of how these birds are moving across the landscape. And there was three states that did color banding either during this project or in the few years just before we started. It's Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico. I don't know if anyone here was lucky enough to actually spot a color banded bird, but in this past season alone, we actually had um, 82 black rosy finches, 145 gray crown rosy finches, and six brown capped rosy finches that were recited by volunteers just like you. Uh -huh. However, most of these color banded birds were recited very near to the locations where they were banded. Several brown capped rosy finches were recited um, and they had traveled about 50 miles from where they were first captured and fitted with that science jewelry. So that's really exciting information. It gives us a little bit to inform about how the brown cap rosy finches are moving around. But the most exciting re-site that we had, I'm gonna start by telling the story and saying that the black rosy finch was okay, but it was a bird that got chased by a hawk into a window in the late winter, early spring up in Wyoming. And those lovely volunteers are here on the um, event tonight. Um, and before the bird recovered, uh, they were able to get a reading of the numbers on that band. And that bloke, black rosy finch had been banded three winters previously in Colorado. So we have some indication that the black rosy finches are from Wyoming, perhaps, or even further to the north, are spending their winters in Colorado. So thank you to all the lucky community, community scientists that spotted those uh, banded birds. But since we had very few recites of those color banded birds outside of their banding location, it led us to believe a few things. Um, first, that the odds of seeing one of these birds is pretty rare. Um, we think that these birds are pretty nomadic and that they really will cover some pretty big ground in search of food. Um, and we also think that, you know, rosy finches aren't using bird feeders maybe in the way that we think they are. Maybe they have a favorite feeder, but otherwise they're relying on natural food sources. Um, 
And, you know, some people may have seen rosy finches roving around the canyon lands and just open country. Um, and those birds are a lot more hard to detect. But luckily, um, we didn't put all of our rosy finch eggs in one basket. And we use a secondary method to describe rosy finch movement. So we can take small samples of feathers um, that are carefully clipped, uh, just little clippings of feathers from uh, folks, professionals like Brian would collect these. And then we can analyze the isotopic signatures in these feathers and then correlate it with places on these maps, which are called isoscapes. So on this image is um, what one of these maps looks like. So this white star is the location that a gray crown rosy finch was captured in the winter. And this map shows where it's darkest red. That's the highest probability where that bird probably grew its feathers, which would be basically like in the August time. So the gray crown, this gray crown rosy finch that we captured most likely came from somewhere in interior Alaska um, in the Yukon or maybe even Northern BC. Um, we would have loved to pair this, you know, the observations of color bands from our volunteers with this data set to like really tell a extremely convincing story. But alas, um, like I said, it was just really hard to come by uh, those color banded birds. Um, it's another thing to mention is that as this community grew um, of hundreds of people looking for rosy finches, another objective that we uh, tested was if we could use feeder counts as a long-term monitoring method to monitor the health of rosy finch populations, because obviously it's way easier to get close to rosy finches at a home bird feeder than it is at the top of a mountain. However, we now know that these birds are shifting their habitats quite a lot based on things like weather and food sources or the severity of the winter. So our counts just have what we call in science, like a lot of uncertainty around them. So it turns out moving ahead that this wasn't the best method for monitoring um, rosy finches in the long term. Just a couple like unexpected insights. Um, I'll, I'll highlight just a few of them is um, we really were able to document that March is a big time for rosy finch movement. And that's really thanks to your feeder count data. So thank you for that, everyone. And we did document disease in rosy finches. Um, there's been very few uh, records of rosy finches with salmonella. That's unfortunately a somewhat common disease of birds that use bird feeders. Um, so thank you for everyone that shared those observations. Um, we've shared those with our state partners, um, wildlife veterinarians so that they can track that and what that means for the population of rosy finches. And just a reminder, it's always so important to keep a clean, uh, a clean bird feeder. Um, and the influence of weather on rosy finches using bird feeders is definitely a thing. Um, not only is there a higher chance of detecting a rosy finch at a feeder, but there are larger flocks on stormy days. And that information um, is actually proven to be quite helpful because we're working on a survivorship um, model and putting in um, these patterns of weather has actually been in incredibly helpful to have a stronger model so that we can inform our understanding of the survival of rosy finches. And then lastly, I'll share like something that has been really lovely and unexpected is just this amazing community. Um, Tempe uh, started a professional working group um, for people that were professionals and researchers that were passionate about this species. And with support from this team, that working group went from about a dozen people to over 80 people. And that interest and love for rosy finches um, has just really led to more research being done than ever before. And in my opinion, rosy finches are finally getting the attention that they deserve. So, um, you know, people like Brian and Tempe, who are brave professionals, um, they are going to carry this work forward. Um, and focusing on some of the research on the breeding season, that uh, seems to be the best time to get things like population estimates and monitor trends in these populations. Um, and another thing that we've done is come up with a list of research priorities um, that are based on activities that things that managers and conservationists can actually do to help protect rosy finches. For example, like ensuring that habitat in the alpine remains resilient as vegetation is changing and shifting because of warmer temperatures in the alpine. 
So there's plenty of opportunities to keep sciencing and we hope that you will. There's of course eBird. And if you've never been an eBirder before, it's so fun and easy. I encourage you to just Google eBird and just go have fun. You can't break it. Um, that information is definitely being used not only by state wildlife managers, but the Cornell um, Bird Lab is doing pretty incredible things with the data that people like you collect. Uh, the Cornell Lab also has a project feeder watch, which is pretty similar to the feeder counts. However, it does require you have a home feeder. Um, I encourage you to check that out. And if you happen to recreate in the Alpine in the summer, um, on our website, we do have an incidental form. So if you happen to spot a rosy finch or hear a rosy finch in the Alpine, you can report that. And that would be appreciated because in many of these mountain ranges, we don't even know if rosy finches are there. So even just having that, like, are they there or not information is actually um, uh, really, really helpful. And of course, um, we will forever be rosy finchers. So if you have any questions or do spot a colored banded bird at your feeder, please reach out to us um, at Sage and Collaborative. We'll happy to vet the information and get, make sure it gets into the, the right hands. And um, if you're here in Utah, uh, both Sageland, uh, Sageland Collaborative and Tracy Aviary offer a number of community science programs. And if you need support finding cool community science programs in your state, you can also reach out to us and we can make sure that we connect the dots for you. So with that, it's been just like an immense pleasure and a great honor to work with all you Rosie Finchers. Um, thank you for sharing all your stories, all your beautiful Rosie Finch photography. And um, yeah, I'm really excited for the future of Rosie Finches. I think that their, um, their future is looking a little rosier, thanks to everyone um, and people like you. So thank you so much. Um, with that, um, we have, I'd like to hold like five minutes to do some Q&A with our experts. And if you'd like to put questions in the chat, that's the best way to communicate. And I'll read those questions and pass them off to the experts. And after five minutes, we'll kind of end the program. But if anyone wants to stay on for maybe like another five to eight minutes, we can do that and, and get into some more questions with our experts. So thank you so much. Okay. And I encourage you all to, if you if you're feeling um, you're feeling social, uh, show your lovely faces, say hi to folks. Um, like I said, it really is great seeing you all because for many of you, I know your names through all the data forms that I have QA QC'd, and it's really lovely to see you. So, okay, well, I'm going to start with a question. Um, Brian, is it true that the state of Utah has started doing breeding season surveys for rosy finches? Oh, you might be on mute, Brian. Oh, maybe your sound isn't working. That's no good. You can answer the question in the chat, perhaps. All right, I'm gonna throw us while we're waiting for Brian's um, volume. Uh, so Tempe is one of very few biologists that really piloted rosy finch surveys in the summertime. Um, Tempe, can you describe just how difficult it is to do a rosy finch survey, like what it actually entails to get up there? Yeah, it is. I think that was one of the precluding factors that kept researchers from understanding rosy finches on their breeding range. Uh, it's just too hard. Um, and it takes maybe a certain kind of personality, although people say to me, oh, you're so brave. And I'm like, well, I don't think I'm brave. I just am very passionate and willing to put myself through many sleepless nights for two months of summer. <laughs> but um, in Idaho, we have a lot of roadless areas and some of our access to surveys has been as long as 13 miles. Actually one was 17, I think. Um, luckily in the region of Idaho I work in, we have opportunities to partner with game wardens who have stock. And so they've actually packed us into these surveys. Sometimes we get to ride, sometimes we hike and they pack our belongings. Um, and it's a really nice break 
throughout those two grueling months to have maybe four or five horse trips where we just get to go along for the ride and eat steaks at, at camp <laughs> instead of freeze dried meals. So yeah, it, it involves a lot. And then when you're up there and you saw in the video, us traversing the talus, you know, it's really dangerous. And Idaho is lucky that it hasn't had any unfortunate events. And I think it's just luck of the draw and heads up in the field because it might not seem as dangerous as it is, but to traverse that talus at that elevation and some of the slopes we encounter, cliffs, snow fields with frozen ice on top, um, you really have to be careful and have your wits about you. So yeah, and I've learned a lot about all of the above through the years just because of Rosie Finches, like I said. Yeah, I shadowed, um, and Sarah joined as well, shadowed Tempe on a, a couple Rosie Finch surveys. And um, I see the question from Heather is that if there's any opportunities for community science um, on the breeding season side of things. And for our organization, I was like, this is going to be a hard no, because we had, there was rock fall coming off the cliffs. It's just so dangerous. So the thought of putting um, our precious volunteers and that kind of risky environment is um, not something that we feel really great about. That being said, if on your own time and your own health insurance and risk, if you'd like to, um, yeah, if you observe a rosy finch, like please pop it in eBird or you can check out that form and fill it out that is on our website. Like I said, you really, if you really want to be like, feel like a National Geographic explorer, there truly are mountain ranges where there haven't been rosy finches reported. So even like that, like, is a rosy finch there? Like that's, that's kind of still very nuanced information. So um, yeah, if, if you guys are eBird users, if you haven't downloaded the Merlin app, oh, it's so good. And you can record um, rosy finch calls and even have your phone identify them for you. So check it out. Oh, okay, Alex asks, what food do these high alpine finches depend on? Uh, Cooper, do you wanna take that one? Sure. Yeah, so um, a lot of time, it, during, especially during the breeding season, the rosy finches are eating insects. So um, a lot of time they are eating um, insects that are kind of at the edges of snow fields or that have been blown into snow fields. Um, yeah, and then they also rely on seeds, of course, as like many of you have maybe seen them come to feeders and eat seeds. And especially in the, the winter, the non-breeding season, um, that makes up a big portion of their diet. So um, just finding, you know, seed sources out and about, not just at feeders. Excellent. Um, someone put in the comments that rosy finches eat ice worms. And yes, they do. Ice worms are this really, really neat, um, critter <laughs> that resides in glaciers in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I put the link to the NPR story about ice worms and the gentleman, Scott Hodling, that studies them. And he actually now does research here at Utah State. So the ice worm guy is here and gray crown rosy finches eat ice worms. So kind of a neat thing. Um, yeah, we've got time for one more question. If someone's got one, throw it in the chat. And at this point, if you want to just go off mute and grab the mic. Brian, is your sound working? Mic check. Ah. Well, I'll ask Tempe, um, what are the other species that you've seen on your surveys? And what species What species have you not seen yet? <laughs> I've never seen a gray crowned rosy finch on the breeding grounds in Idaho. Although um, we have had a report in the Seven Devils of part, which is in Eastern, Western Idaho of gray crowns. And then actually Ben Vernasco, who I saw on this call, it, he targeted gray crowns or hybrids because the Seven Devils is a hybrid zone. And he went to this spot. Honestly, you could probably have him talk about it. And he shared some really crazy, exciting photos with us. So, you know, I think Ben's got his own little project he's working on there with those hybrids. So I haven't seen hybrids or gray crowns in some of the areas that I work in, but the bitterroots, which are in my region are another hybrid zone where hybrids were collected back in the 1950s when 
when rosy finches were undergoing their first pulse of research interest and then it kind of died down really until it seems like 2019 people picked it back up. Um, and the other animals Idaho surveys for are pika, hoary marmots, mountain goats, bighorn sheep. And we were just kind of anecdotally reporting American pipits. But after two years, I was like, we see way less pipits than even black rosy finches. And so now we are sampling them under the same protocol. And honestly, in five years, I just am telling the data today and yesterday, we've seen 58 pipits in Idaho. And in five years, we've seen almost 2000 black rosy finches. So ding, 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 like the next thing I'm going to look at in the Alpine and Idaho is American pipits. So. Very cool. Stephen asked if there's any plans for breeding surveys in Grand County in the LaSalle Mountains. I don't know, Brian, if you want to reply to him. Um, I, I'm going to go on a limb and say there probably are. That's a juicy little spot for rosy finches in Utah. Brian's shaking his head. Cool. Well, um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we just are so grateful for everything that you do. Um, and at this time, our event is met its end. And um, I'm happy to stay on if folks want to just chit chat and socialize a little bit more. But thanks all for tuning in. And there's still going to be lots of information on Sage and Collaborative's website. And of course, you can find the link to the video on Sage and Collaborative's YouTube um, page. So that will that will go live um, in the next day. So if you want to share that link without any little like bumpy bits too, it's, it'll be ready soon. So thank you, everyone.